Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. I thank the ASC for the invitation. It's a great honor and a privilege. I also want to thank Gary Michaels for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak today about work-related musculoskeletal disorders and sonographers. Uh, I look back in a path to progress. I want to highlight the importance of this topic. This is a really important issue. As a group, we need to work together uh, to advocate our, our, our staff, especially in this moment of time, in light of COVID-19, which is a catastrophic moment for us. I have no disclosures. But th and those are the learning objectives of today's webinar. There are main three, three, three folds. So I'm going to reveal uh, the literature and discuss the main resources uh, in the field. Then we're going to do an overview of work-related musculoskeletal disorders. We're going to define it, discuss uh, the problem from an epidemiological standpoint, discuss its clinical relevance, physiopathology, and understand risk factors. And lastly, we're going to address the problem. So there has been a lot of evidence uh, that's been published by some great resources in the field. John Baker, Kevin Evans, Susan Murphy, uh, you know, uh, Sean Rowe. There are tons of publications that have really described how robust this problem is within the sonographer community. Uh, we are not really reinventing the wheel here, but more or less discuss or chat in what, uh, on what the current problem is, advocating, joining, acting together to be able to address the issue. This is, this is the first paper was published in Sonography in Injuries, was published by Craig in 1985. Interesting here that the author reported that stress, uh, several actually, several uh, injuries to uh, scanning, stress, vision, infections, muscle strain, which is very popular, back injuries, what's a frequently mentioned problem, long-term hazards, and also electrical shock. And summary, I think it's very important what he said, it's that many of these complications are avoidable. In a subsequent study in 1997, uh, they studied almost 1,000 sonographer, uh, sonographers with a moderate response rate, and they found that 84% of the sonographers reported pain. Interesting here in the figure, you see that skinny activities that aggravate pain now in the bottom, you see the mean aggravation score, which one, one, which means knots, and five, very aggravating. You see that shoulder abduction, applied pressure, and sustained twists of the neck and trunk were the most aggravating activities to sonographers. The consequence of scanning related pain, it's in this figure. And you see that vast majority of sonographers reported pain in performance of work, home and recreation activities. That's why in 2003 was published the industry standards for the prevention of work-related musculoskeletal disorders in sonographer. And since then, there's been significant improvements in the workstation equipment and ultrasound systems. Today, we have ultrasound systems that have uh, just some degree of adjustability and, and, and exam rooms that now are designed uh, for various types of applications. But despite those improvements, in 2008, they studied uh, almost 3,000 sonographers. It, that's, to me, the, that's it's the largest part, participant sample to date. And they found the prevalence of, of work-related musculoskeletal pain in sonographers was too high. So there was actually, there was an increase in 90% since the last large scale survey in 1997. When you look here in the same paper, you look at the locations of pain, you see that shoulder and neck were the most frequently affected body site. And this is a complex figure, but I wanna go over with you. You see here, uh, uh, you can see that they, uh, they it's, it's the, this is the pain aggravation by job demands. You see that uh, when you look at down the bottom, you can see the applied transducer pressure, which is in orange. You see here on the right, on the right means very aggravating, 
and, and, and on left, not aggravating, and apply transduce pressure on the right, which means that further aggravate symptoms, which means that was the, the biggest cause of aggravation, as opposed on your left, which is green, means performing measurements, uh, which is not very aggravating uh, of symptoms. Then we look at uh, pain aggravated by positions. At the same, if you look on your right, seen in green, that sustained shoulder abduction also was the biggest cause of aggravation, followed by the purple, which means sustained twisting, 47%, and repetitive twisting in orange, 42%. Then it comes our paper that was published in 2019 in JAYS. And what's the difference between our, uh, our paper and others? So there, there are no much difference. I mean, there are some, of course, but again, we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, uh, our study uh, had higher sonographer's response rate and most research uh, studies on, on top had a limited response rate. Also had the control group, and which is important, and to our knowledge, uh, uh, most of the studies, they had absence of control groups, and we statistically adjust uh, pain for confounders. When you look at the enrollment, we identify almost more than 600 employees, and of them, 253 were non-respondents. Again, only 19 sonographers are higher response rates. Uh, leaving here, 433, of those 17 partially completed the survey, leaving the final cohort 416, only 11 sonographers and 305 uh, controls. And interesting when you look at the clinical variables on your left sonographers, on your uh, right controls, we see that sonographers were younger and had their lower BMI. No difference were found between uh, in terms of of uh, gender, height, years in the current position, work setting, handedness, rest of their size, etc. When you see uh, interesting here that the prevalence of pain was much higher in sonographers and red box, 86% compared to peer employees, 46%. Even though when you adjust, uh, uh, when you perform a multivariate analysis, if you see down the bottom here, sonographers, the occupational sonographer was strongly associated with muscle skeletal pain after adjustment for age, gender, height, uh, weight, BMI, all risk factors, uh, uh, work setting, years in the current position of regular exercise. Then uh, when you look also, uh, when you look at uh, work related by body region, again, uh, now neck, shoulder were the most frequently affected body site. It was a little post in the literature, uh, and literature showed it comes first, but they are coming close. And the impact of work-related musculoskeletal disorder is shown in this table. You see that the pain interfered in the performance of daily activities, 32 versus 10%, uh, all P, quite strong, significant, uh, interfered on, with work activities and several work activities, uh, doing difficult, difficult uh, doing, doing user work due to pain, uh, doing your work as you as you'd like, spending your using amount of time doing your work, and also interfere with sleeping, recreational activities, household chores. The sonographers had more headaches. They made plans to change job. So 9% versus 0.5. They missed the work due to pain. And they had, uh, they had, they made changes uh, to their work related responsibilities. Uh, they had more work restrictions. They were placed on short or long-term disability, and, and the DASH score and the DASH work score were both greater. Well, again, when you look at the medical evaluation here, when you look at the impact, excuse me, you see that sonographers were more like, sonographers the red box, were more likely to seek medical evaluation, surgical, surgical treatment, prescription pain medications, over-the-counter medications, topical medications, physical therapy, massage, heat or cold basin therapy, chiropractor. And that leads us to our first take home message. Work-related muscle pain is much more prevalent and severe as compared to pain employees, 80 to 9%. In work-related muscle pain, sonographers impacts daily sleep and recreation, 
work-related activities as well as future employment plans. And neck, shoulder were the most frequently affected body sites. Well, the definition of work-related musculoskeletal pain are conditions that are caused uh, or aggravated by workplace activities, work-related musculoskeletal disorders, I'd say. Develop gradually over a period of time from repeated exposure to a variety of risk factors. It is painful disorders affect muscles, ligaments, tendons, and nerves. Why so it's important? As most of you probably already know, so muscle skeletal disorders is the most prevalent cause of injury in sonographers. And particular, uh, uh, this study again, they study 3,000 sonographers. The pain was was uh, reported by not 90% of sonographers. And what's most striking here, that's level is much higher than other specialty within the healthcare industry, perhaps, other than perhaps hands-on CNA. Well, this is what it looks like on the x-ray. Obviously, obviously, poor ergonomic stress to these joints, which induces a high level of, the, of the degenerative joint disorder, but it's likely from microtrauma, or repair of motion, especially if you are not a scanning ergonomic pattern. No importance, a big issue. It's historically, 57% of sonographers have failed to report symptoms to their supervisors. This is a big issue. This is a big problem, I would say. One of the largest problems with the sonographer community is transparency in reporting the symptoms. There's a lot of reasons for that, and legitimate reasons, I'll say. Uh, well, you know, certainly know sonographers, when they report injury, they are scared to lose their job. And research has, has shown that, research has shown that muscle skeletal pain sonographers were likely to be unreported and undiagnosed by, very, by, by many reasons, including uh, concerns for the job uh, or, or a presumption that experienced pain is normal part of ultrasound practices. And also, uh, no report, it's a big issue, not only for sonographers, but also fellows and, and providers. You see, ultrasound fellows do not report symptoms either to their program directors. And less experienced sonographers take less time off than seasoned sonographers. Well, discussing the problem from epidemiological sense point and a standpoint, yeah, here, if you go back and look some of the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, you see the number of work injuries resulting in days away from work by medical treatment facility visit and red hospitalization, orange emergency room visit only, and blue, no medical treatment facility. And by nature of injury, down the bottom, you see that sprains, strains, and tears are counted for the most causes in days away from work. And when you take a closer look, you see that many of those non-occupational injuries were serious, most often resulting in 31 or more days in yellow. So the vast majority of injuries, we can consider maybe uh, that are lost major work time. Well, in, in between 2014 to, to 2017, loss work time were fairly constant. Then there was an increase in loss work time case in 2018. And the 2018 is the most recent data that you have. And in 2018, uh, it actually correlates, the data it actually correlates to a high level of loss of work time per case relative to other similar industries. Why it's so important? Well, pain interferes also with other activities. And the 2014 Australia survey they studied 325 sonographers, and the degree of pain here is an interesting, varied the degree of pain. And we see in blue is light pain, severe pain, red, and in green, they never had pain. So in green box, you see that 58% of the sonographers reported pain during work activities, 59 outside of work, and 56 experienced pain, uh, experiencing sleep disruption which I think for me it's more concerning this figure is in the red box. So, well, 23%, I would say 23, 22, uh, they reported or experienced severe disruption. If you take a closer look, 23% of the sonographers uh, experienced career and injuries in this study. So beyond all those high prevalence, costs also are high. And here are, the, the, here are some of the direct costs 
and disabilities in the workforce. So if you see here in the graph, overexertion involved outside source is the biggest cause in terms of billion of dollars, 15. So if you combine with another one, uh, risk factor uh, for injury in sonographers, which is repetitive motion, can we imagine the total cost in terms of billion of dollars? Actually, it's been already studied and they've shown that it's about $20 billion yearly with direct costs, such as workers' compensations and medical expenses. And if you include indirect costs, such as loss of revenue, uh, costs related to hiring, training new employees, that could, that's, this number could reach up to five times that. And that leads us to a second take-home message that work-related musculoskeletal disorders develop gradually over a period of time. Work-related musculoskeletal disorders resulting from work activities are among the most frequent reported causes of street or loss of work time, and they cost employers up to 20 billion yearly in direct costs. Well, let's move over to physiopathology. Excuse me, Olivia. Excuse me, physiopathology. And this is a common model uh, for sonographers to receive repetitive motion injuries. And, uh, it's quite fairly straight. So it's been published in the literature for a long time. You see that the insult to the tissue directly, uh, actually directly correlates to the number of repetition and force or tension. And inversely correlates to amplitude and relaxation. So when I talk about uh, scan time, duration of scans, duration between scans, all those factors kind of come into play when you talk about injury to our cells, basically. Uh, there are two main processes that cause uh, our musculoskeletal pain. One is overuse or strain of the muscles, another is obstruction of venous return. And overuse or strain of the muscles may cause micro tears at the tender insertions, resulting in ischemia and tissue breakdown. Obstruction of venous return may cause enlargement of tender shifts, resulting in scary and compression of the nerves. With prolonged nerve compression, loss of functional occurs. When do the symptoms begin? Well, when, when sonographers begin their career, so it can start as long as, as, long as six months, so it's early, so 15% here in this study, uh, they have started having symptoms. If no action is taken, that could progress. So it can progress and pain would become more frequent. That's why it's important to recognize the stage of progression. So early stage means that the pain occurs during the work shift, but disappears at night and during days off. Intermediate stage, the pain occurs early in the work and persists at night. Late stage, uh, pain persists at rest, but there's also fatigue and weakness, inability to sleep and to perform light duties. And that leads us to our third take home message, injury to the tissues directly correlates to the number of repetitions to the force or tension and inversely correlates to the amplitude and relaxation. Overuse or strain and venous return obstruction are the two main processes that cause injury. And identification of symptoms and early, at early stage is crucial to prevent long-term injuries. Well, when it comes to risk factors, uh, they can be divided into biomechanical and environmental, administrative factors, work practices. Biomechanical and environmental, these include the workstation, the exam room equipment, the ultrasound system, and the exam room layout. Administrative factors, these relate to scheduling of patient exams and sonographer rotation schedules. So if you're a sonographer, if you are working beyond your regularly working hours due to staffing shortages and busy patient schedule, be aware that your muscles need, your muscles need to recover. And work practices, these are the postures sonographers you use when scanning or work at the computer workstation. Those are the most common ones, so work practices. And you see awkward or sustained postures are generally the most common. In a picture here, it's, it's, it's worth than a thousand words. You see that sonographers always look for the best scan possible. Awkward or sustained posture occur when the body parts are positioned away from their neutral position. So the further from neutral, as you see in the picture, the further from neutral or the longer the awkward or awkward posture sustain. There are some examples. So flexion or extension of the wrist, excess shoulder bump, abduction, forward 
uh, flexion of their shoulders or reaching, especially scanning obese patients, bending, twisting at the waist, bending, the rotate of the neck. Repetition is another risk factor, so when you perform the same or similar tasks repetitively, either continually or frequently for an extended period of time without adequate recovery. Think about, so if you perform the same type of exam throughout the day, or you use the same muscle day, so that's a repetition. So the severity increases with higher repetition. Another one is force, is the exertion of physical effort applied by a body part to perform a task. So higher forces or longer duration of force increase risks. An example, pushing, pulling, lifting, gripping, just keep in mind, so pinching. So in, in sonography, it's often associated with downward pressure of the transducer and a grip force used to hold the transducer. Contact pressure, pressure is between a body parts and external objects and when resting, the, occurs when resting with the grip of offered arm against the eczema table while scanning. Some other interesting risk factors when it comes to, um, when it comes to repetitive motion, one-sided static work. Remember, so if you always scan on the right side, that can, that can put your right side at risk. Scan your obese patients, uh, you need to reach across the patients. It requires extended reach and or excess abduction. Night shifts, this is really new in the healthcare. Night shift workers, general, in general, they, they suffer injury on the job. They have more cardiac disease, they have high rate CVAs, MIs, that's purely because it's purely a night working at night. When you perform more than 100 scans per month, 13 or more hours per day, and when you, have, you don't have enough time or rest between shifts, you, when you have long scan time, when we're doing bedside echo, it underlines degenerative joint disorder. Here's an example of the work equipment, on power work equipment, I mean, take your time sonography. So take your time to set up the table, uh, uh, adjust the chair, the ultrasound monitor, whether it's too high or too low, like shown in the picture, can affect your shoulder, you see both sides, your back. Show the injuries also, is a, as I said, is, is a common, very common, the most common lesion in an angle abduction greater than 30 puts the shoulder at risk especially for scan, scanning for a long time. As you see in the picture, show this abductor more than 30. So what do you do? So some tips, if you move closer to, uh, to the patient, can reduce arm abduction. In addition to arm abduction and overextension, perform exams of scanning arm behind the shoulder and unsupported, like shown in the picture, put their shoulder at risk. Back injury, uh, here in the picture, you see that twisting of the back, spinal rotation can also lead to back pain and back rota and back and back injury. And once again, if you move closer to the patient, can improve uh, the need for to uh, reduce the need for uh, twisting. Here's an example of wrist flexion, uh, and uh, you see. Uh, you see, when you rotate, just, just, just a tip, when you rotate the probe or the transducer, remember to rotate the transducer in your hands, in the hands, rather than turning the wrist. And, and pinch grip, keep in mind that when you do a pinch grip, you are using the smallest muscle of the body, which requires up to, up to five times in muscle and tendon force than a palmer grip. That's why an uh, optimal tr transducer grip is a palmer grip. So when you hold the transducer with your fingers in your palm, you distribute the weight evenly across the whole hand. I like this picture. You know, it's kind of summarizes everything. You see that your forearm should be horizontal to the floor, which allows the, sh the shoulder to be in a neutral position. The angle is less than 30. There is no spine rotation. You see the monitor height is perfect here. And also the neck. The, there is no neck extension, and importantly, the neck should be flexed slightly to 10, 15 degrees. And that takes us to our fourth take-home message. Common causes of work-related muscular disorders in sonographer, 
Sonographers include biomechanical and environmental, administrative factors, and work practices. Awkward or sustained postures are generally the most common cause. Shoulder abduction, neck, flash move, back twisting, elbow extension, wrist flash extension, pinch grip are all high risk work postures. Ideally, the shoulder should be abducted less than 30 and the neck slightly flexed to be 10, 15 degrees. Now we're gonna kind of move to the path forward addressing the problem. Education, certainly education is a great challenge. We are trying to educate sonographers, fellows, our community as we understand more the issue. You know, uh, probably it's, uh, it's re relevant that we educate in, in, within our commu community, but I think it's also very important to educate outside of your community, engage other associations, uh, with other associations, regulate or regulatory agencies, uh, medical community, which is really important. Uh, there's some also need to be oversight from a personal as well a supervisor level. Both employers and employees should be aware of injuries. Transparency is important. Transparency and report the issue. Sonographers should feel comfortable reporting injuries to their employers. And employers should be forward to recognize when these injuries patterns occur. Another important feature that I think is much greater and, and then a personal level that employee uh, level, it's, uh, there some, needs some, some change in the culture. Everyone has a, a role in maintaining a change, a culture of safety. And that's why employee, man, employer and manufacturer should all work together with mutual respect in order to work for a culture of safety. That's why in, uh, in 2003, originally published in 2003, the industry standards for the prevention of work-related musculoskeletal disorders published the first uh, guideline and it was updated in 2017. You see that uh, this is really, really is a comprehensive uh, guide on the role of if each member, so each each departments, each uh, groups, allies, so a role of the manufacturers, employers, educators, sonographers, and the reduction of risk for work-related musculoskeletal disorders. It goes beyond ergonomic uh, equipment designs. And I've just put a little bit of some of the roles here. The role of sonographers avoid scanning positions that require extremes, familiarization with your workstation equipment. Take time to set up the room, the equipment properly. Work with other practitioners. Yes, so observe others, uh, their postures. Advise one another. Yeah, it's important to make some improvements. Ensure that students are observed for ergonomics early in their career before they can develop bad habits. And undertake regular risk assessment and limit the number and types of scans. Be mindful of your body. So encourage early report of symptoms. Get fit, stay fit, build some, some strength, especially in the upper, upper members. Warm up. Warm up before scanning and perform stretching exercise between patients. Frequent rest. And consider having a named person responsible for ergonomics within the department. For employers, be aware of schedules. You allow for adequate breaks vary exam types whenever possible, limit number and types of scans again, limit portable bedside exams to critical patients, provide adequate space in scanning rooms for proper patient positioning, and maintain reasonable expectation regarding the limitations of body habits on the ability to obtain diagnostic image data, and provide equipment with exam specific features and adjustability for optimizing scanning posture. Well, some policies and guidelines, availability of written safety guidelines and policies, action stakes by management to improve safety, working involved in the writing of safety-related policies, many management attitudes regarding safety practices, availability of relevant safety and protect equipment. The role of manufacturers are must primarily a consideration in the design of apparatus and equipment used in the practice of sonographer. Cutting edge in design, screen rotation, movement, lighter weight transducer, wireless, etc., and PPEs. And that leads us to our fifth take home message increase awareness, 
education, and transparency. Culture of safety, so everyone has a role. Now, I'm going to introduce to you a very special guest today. It's a surprise guest. I'm just going to hold a second. I'm going to... You may begin, Ms. P Baker. Yes, okay. yes, excuse me, now I'm here. Yeah, so excuse me, now I'm going to introduce a very special guest. Uh, I'm thrilled to announce a very important surprise guest. Yes, she was born and educated in England. In 1965, she came to the U.S. at the invitation of Stanford Medical Center to open the Department of Trussell. She has 59 years experience in sonography, with 30 of those years spent in education. She was the co-founder and first president of Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography in 70 to 71, and founder and first chair of the American Registry Diagnostic Medical Sonography. She was chair of the Joint Review Committee Diagnostic Medical Sonography, and more recently, she was president of Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography from 97 to 99. She has specialized, specialized in ergonomics since 95 and the impact of work-related muscular disorders in sonor on sonographers. She testified to, to OSHA on ergonomic stands in the Clinton and Bush administration and chaired the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography International Consensus Conference on Occupational Injury in Sonography, May 2003. She was awarded the Society of Diagnostic, of Diagnostic Medical Sonography Education Award and the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine Sonographer of the Year Award 2003. She is the president and a partner of South Ergonomics. She retired from teaching in August 2004 to concentrate on ergonomic issues. She, had, she has had expert witness experience in many legal cases involving sonographers. She has also testified at the OSHA hearings and supported the wish ergonomic rule result in sonography being considered a caution zone job in Washington State. She has talked on this subject to sonographers and held tutorials to educate them as to the risks and prevention of these injuries all over the US, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and China. She has consulted with many commercial manufacturers with regard to equipment and skin hair design. Because of her, Yes, and all our accomplishments, I'm certainly sure that I owe her a lot. That's why I invite you. Please welcome John Baker. Good afternoon or good evening, maybe it is where you are. I'm on the west coast of the United States, so it's still very early in the afternoon here. Well, according to the data collected by ASE in 2001, there was an 83% incidence of cardiac sonographers scanning in pain, 16% with a chronic injury and 4% requiring surgery. This data collection involved 1,161 surveys, which were returned out of a mailing of 2,500, which is a very good return rate on any survey. The multi-specialty survey done in 1995 reported an incidence of 84%, which rose to 90% in 2008. And of those, 20% were career-ending injuries. Given the incidence of scanning in pain, do we need to be concerned? And if so, why? Well, this is a very high incidence rate that would not be tolerated in any other industry. But the issue is also one of economics. Ultrasound is being considered as the first modality of choice in the work of a uh, workup of a patient. And this will only be possible if there is a manpower present to deliver the care. If you career end one out of every five of your workforce and the other 70% are scanning in pain, then it is only a matter of time when they join the career ended group. You cannot support replacement from this loss. You are also losing your most experienced and hence the most productive members of the workforce. 
Productivity. In order to increase productivity, you must do more in the same time. The more equipment advances, the more medical questions and demands get asked, um, and the longer it takes to collect and um, analyze that data. Making all cardiac studies bedside studies slows productivity, and it always seems to be that the patient that you have to do is the one nearest the window, which means you become a furniture remover before you become a decorator of the windows to blind the sunlight from coming through and preventing you from doing your echo. All studies being completed rather than targeted ones are also decreasing throughput. I think we'll be more inclined to consider um, targeted studies after this pandemic, as that's what is, I believe, being done now. But I know it's not palatable ideas, but there are only eight hours in a working day, and there's only a pint in a pint pot. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. More awareness to work-related MSDs today than back in 1995. In fact, back then, I would be asked, I would get many phone calls in one week uh, of sonographers who were scanning in pain, and they were amazed to find out that there were other people suffering the same way. And I don't get those phone calls anymore. So I think the awareness is far greater than it was back then. In early 2000, reimbursement changed. And one of the solutions was by the management was to increase the throughput, squeeze more patients per sonographer into that eight or 10 hour working day. Change in product production methods shortened the time where muscles and tendons could recover allowing more studies to be done without recovery. The increase in demands caused job dissatisfaction, and it's well known that an unhappy workforce have increased stress in the workplace that can even reach toxic levels. Labs operating on self-pace seem less stressful and operate more smoothly. I assume you know what self-pace is. It's um, when you, do your patient and when you're done and you had a chance to take a little rest, you go and get the next patient rather than being given a schedule at the beginning of the day, which always gets added to. And you have to stress of having to get through whatever those, that patient list is. In 1997, 80% of sonographers were between the ages of 30 and 50. Just 12 years later in 2008, in a survey of greater than 3000 sonographers, it showed the age has shifted to 30% who were over 50 years of age, compared to 8.3% in 1997. This may account for some of the increase in injury, since with age our tendons become more brittle. This is also means that prevention becomes even more important. Next slide, please. Just because the job has risk factors doesn't mean you're going to develop a work-related MSD. Whether or not a risk factor will result in a work-related MSD depends on the duration or how long you've been exposed to it, the frequency, how often are you exposed to it, and how much rest for recovery do you get, the intensity, how much force is needed to make that diagnostic image. And of course, if you get a combination of these, it's obvious that that will increase the likelihood of injury will occur. This picture we're going to come back to in a moment. Um, I want to show you something in that picture. Next slide, please. Some, I wanted to particularly pick these pictures because let's take a look at the two at the top. This is the same piece of very good ergonomic equipment the same stretcher, the same patient, even the same sonographer. But at the end of the day, which one do you think feels more comfortable? The one on the left or the one on the right? They're both cardiac scans and they're both right-handed cardiac scans. Um, you may be not as familiar with the second picture where the patient is facing the equipment and you're facing the other way. That's the way to do a right-handed scan the same way left-handed um, sonographers do it. So if you're um, a sonographer who does 
cardiac and other things as well, in which you scan with your right hand, and now you do cardiac with your right hand, you'd be better to do it in that second picture like that than you would be to do it the other way because the abduction of your arm is decreased and that is a major cause of problem. Um, I also put this bottom picture in, not because it was a good picture of good ergonomics by any means, but it does have one feature which I don't find present very often in the clinical world. And that is that the, there's a tendency to rotate the control panel towards the patient like it is in this picture. That is the wrong way. It needs to go the other way about the same amount so that you decrease the amount of problems with your wrist. So you need to turn it about five or 10 degrees the other way. Um, next. Yeah. The, the um, shoulder and neck um, were, are the most um, common injury site. It used to be the neck was first and the shoulder was second. They've always been very close, but we believe that the neck becomes second now because the manufacturers put the um, monitor separate from the control panel, making it possible to put the monitor in a much better position when you're scanning. And so that will reduce the neck injury. Wrist is third and hands and fingers and upper back, usually around T4. But just look at these pictures. Look at the top left-hand corner. Here we have obvious abduction, but why in, is the sonographer finding it necessary to scan over the side rail? This seems very bizarre to me that anybody would not take a few minutes to take that side rail down so that they were not scanning like that. You can also see that the monitor is too low. The next a picture is one of a also right-handed over the back scanning and look at the twist on her neck. It's not surprising that after spending her day in that position she would be in less than a comfortable evening. The third picture is the wrist and the hyperflexion of the wrist in that um, right-handed position over the back of the patient. Now we return to that picture that I showed you in two slides ago. What I want to point out to you is you can't tell how much force is being exerted in a static picture until you look at the white knuckles coming through those gloves. That tells you that there's a lot of force being exerted there. And the picture at the bottom left, that is when you go to the subcostal and you don't take the time to, to step backwards. Normally the cost, subcostal and the um, uh, is done standing up rather than sitting down because that's a lot of strain on the shoulder to push down on the belly at that, in that angle of abduction. But it's also scanning what we say behind the midline, which is also an insult to the shoulder. Finally, we got a picture that we call the magic triangle. We found that if you line up the monitor with your center of your body, your hand will be in just the right position and you will be able to engage your patient in, in your study, as well as engage the equipment in it in a normal ergonomic way. And you can see the shoulders and the, um, uh, the relationship of the shoulders to the, to the patient and so on. The patient is a little too far away in my view on that picture, should be a little closer. Um, there's a bit too much uh, of the um, echo bed in, in sight there. And the next picture, the next slide, so how are we going to solve this problem? Well, I must say I'm disappointed in the, in the progress of solving it, but um, I was involved a few years ago um, with a, uh, a research study into the use of a transducer, a special transducer by anesthesiologists for doing nerve blocks. And a small group of these anesthesiologists attended an all day lecture on this transducer and they got very excited about it. It was one that just fit over the finger. And um, they came to an ICU room which had been put up like a patient room with a mannequin in the bed. And they were given the transducer and told to go ahead and give it a try. Well, none of the anesthesiologists had ever held a transducer before and they were very eager to try it. 
They approached the mannequin and not one changed the height of the bed, nor did they even uh, change the workstation or make it other adjustments to do this task in a more comfortable way. And I was actually watching the natural way that people scan, which unfortunately most of the time turns out to be not quite the right way. So we have to educate everybody to, to how to do it the, the most ergonomic way. Um, so uh, I was just, I was a little surprised to find that these anesthesiologists didn't adjust their workstation. It was a bit, dis it was disappointing, but it highlighted the problem that we face. Um, when I started to study this early on in 1995, I was given a talk, I, I was giving a talk and after the talk, a physician came up to me and he said that he had been a consultant in a work related incident in the general populace, not in the medical um, field. He was actually studying the chicken pluckers. And at the end of the day, after much time and effort, they had to change completely the way they pluck chickens. And he said, I think you're going to find the same thing with sonography. You may have to change the way you scan in order to um, reduce the incidence of occupational injury. Um, so maybe we need to become chicken pluckers first and then maybe stenographers and we'll do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Baker. It was wonderful. Yes, very wonderful. In conclusion, the prevalence of work-related musculoskeletal pain or disorders ranges uh, in estimated 80 to 90 percent. Uh, our work-related musculoskeletal disorders in sonographers impacts daily or sleeping, recreation, work-related activities, as well as future employ employment plans. Understand the risk factors are really important. Increase awareness, education, and transparency. A culture of safety. Everyone has a role in advocating for our colleagues, patients, and friends. I want to conclude with this statement. Probably a little bit, part, probably going to a little bit change here. So ultrasound is the visual stethoscopes of the century. I'd like to thank you all. Oops, thank you all. Thank you for listening. Okay, let's move on to the questions now. And Dr. Gomez and Ms. Baker, you can look at those and uh, go ahead and start answering. All right. <clears throat> Um, okay. Did you want to answer the first one or did you want me to? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, left-handed scanning is, doesn't normally get associated with a, um, a, a left shoulder injury of uh, the type that you get with abduction because you're not abducting your arm. But are you, is this pediatrics or is this adult? Uh, it doesn't say. In pediatric echo, there's a tendency to take the weight of everything off of the child. And so you raise your left shoulder or your right shoulder, depending what you're scanning with, to take that weight. And that can cause you a shoulder injury. In adult echocardiography, um, it's, the carpal tunnel syndrome is because of extension and flexion of the wrist, particularly extension because you're uh, without supporting your forearm. So you've got your forearm unsupported and you're holding the transducer with your, um, your hand cupped up upwards in, in a full um, extension or hyperextension. And that can be the cause of it. I'm a, at a loss to tell you the cause of your left shoulder injury without seeing you scan. Your next question says, sonographers should be able to scan with both hands. Not always easy, but it helps. I think that goes to the schools. We have to teach it that way. What happens when you do teach it that way, which I did, they go out into clinical and the, they get greeted with, well, I don't know who taught you how to do that, but we do it this way here. And of course, it 
it's complicated if you're in an academic institution because you've got residents and interns and everybody coming to scan after you. And if you scan with right hand versus left hand, it's, there has to be consistency in, in both the interpreters as well as the, the performers. Otherwise, it becomes a nuisance. And Mrs. Baker, and I just want to share my experience and also it's important, it's so important that also I'm left and right scan, uh, right-handed scanner, it's, 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 it's helped, it helped me a lot. I, I was having left-hander uh, pain, when I start scanning on the right side, it helps much, uh, a lot, yeah, thank you. I agree with you, I just think that once you're, you're very injured in that way, I would tend to turn the patient around and do the right-handed scan the way the left is done rather than switch hands because I don't want to retire and find both sides of my body compromised. Um, but um, I think we ought to learn, we ought to teach that in school and we ought to practice it in the clinical world. I agree. Yeah, uh, are, are there any specific exercises or one should do prior starting your work day? Well, yes, I think it's important. I think doing exercise should be uh, important. And probably uh, some exercise like go swimming uh, and, and then you can improve, they, they're going to improve your blood flow supply to our joint and relaxation also is very really important. Uh, uh, would you comment, in, would you might comment on something or oh, Mrs. Baker, or any other exercise? I would, I would say be very careful that you're doing stretching exercises as opposed to weight bearing exercises. And if you want to do the lifting weights and so on, that you get at least a consult to do it because you can actually do yourself a lot of damage with, with that. But uh, stretching exercises, I think, are a must. Okay. Uh, what do you do to so suggest sonographers should do to reduce work-related MSDs? I would say education. Yeah, I think the more you know about how these things happen, there are, it's not rocket science. There are risk factors and they can be applied to any job. And once you understand those risk factors and you listen to your body, you can correct the, the problems before they become big problems. There's a ocean of questions here. Um, okay, uh, will OSHA start finding uh, these facilities who don't? OSHA has a hard time finding anybody. Um, uh, I know of a situation where a hospital um, was visited by OSHA in an inspection and cited, actually, and they still haven't made any correction. And that's because they're still arguing about which budget is going to pay for it. Um, but uh, OSHA is not putting any pressure on them. Um, I'm a, you say I'm a hospital echo tech, all, all done bedside. Well, okay, that's... Um, so there's yeah. a one, mm, excuse me, sorry. Yeah. There's one no. here, Mrs. Baker, that says that uh, eight, nine patients per day in or out patient clinic is too much to scan. I think there's no magic number. Some papers, uh, they say that's 100 scans per month. But again, a Mayo Clinic paper was six scans uh, per day. I think it's I think it's more important the education the way you're gonna you're gonna perform your exam you're gonna perform your task so it all you all combine all risk factors. It's how how long do they uh, schedule them for? Are the patients scheduled every hour or are they scheduled every half hour? Seven, what seventy five minutes. How many? Se seventy five minutes. Six. Yeah, well, that's usually academia that gets seventy five minutes of scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the outpatient clinic, I'm sure, get, is lucky to get 30. Mm -hmm. and you I, used, up, I used to yeah, ask. Mm. I used to ask how many, how many, you know, to the audience, how long do you schedule patients apart? The least I've ever heard is seven minutes. Um, and I'm glad that I was not the patient. But... Um, Anyway, I, I think eight to nine is considered an average in a day. Um, and as long as, but what's more important is that you have enough time to recover between them. So it comes down to the schedule rather than the numbers. Um, what we just went, um, and you, yeah, OSHA is not the place that you can turn for um, 
litigation or um, demand demands you can uh, you can actually ask for an inspection the chances that you will lose your job if you do that is high um, because you can you know the, you complained um, yeah you say you're in fear of job loss yes yeah. so I think but, it's only yeah so when you said about the number of uh, exams also it's I, I think the quality quality should be the main focus on these exams and the thinking that quantity is better than quality needs to change would you agree yes um Sorry. the healthy sonographer um with the magic triangle that's a very good place to go to see a very good um set of educational material on that uh, healthysonographer.com website. Is there any data on left versus right scanning? Depend on on what? I'm not sure what she what he or she means by data about whether one is better than the other, or what, I'm not sure what the question is there. Yes, it's Karim Moran. Yes, uh, he probably I think he's asking if there is any data showing that left or right is better. Which one? Are you, uh, there is there any any difference between both sides? Thank you, Karim. I think there is difference, but I think it's better to scan with both hands from when you first start, and then it doesn't become that issue. Um, you'll always yeah. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah, sometimes, no. uh, uh, what do you think, uh, Mrs. Baker? Sometimes uh, when we are scanning on the right side, uh, there are too much uh, uh, overreaching uh, and too much uh, arm abduction and wrist flexion. And, 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 and that's what, what we observe and trunk bending compared to the left side. Yes, but you can turn the patient around to face the machine and turn yourself with the back to the patient's face and you can scan with your right hand the same way as the left-handed scanner does. Thank you. So, you know, there is a way to use both hands and still do it in a way that doesn't create abduction. There tends to be more injuries from a left-handed scanning. Back quite a few years ago, you know, the West Coast scanned left-handed and the East Coast scanned right. We had a way to sort those two out, but um, that's not true anymore. I don't know whether one has gone a preference over the other uh, in the out, in the field today. Do you know? Doc, um, mm, yeah, I'm not sure. Which is more, yeah. How many mm. scans should an Ecotech do in an eight hour shift? There is no magic number. One yeah, scan yeah. done non-ergonomically is worse than eight done ergonomically. Good, good answer is Mrs. Baker. <laughs> How do you get the administration to be on board with realizing? Um, the easiest way to get any administrator on board is to talk dollars and cents. And by that I mean calculate what it is to, if you're injured versus not and what it costs to give you an ergonomic workstation economically. There is a really strong argument to be made for the economics of ergonomics. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there aren't any other questions, we can end today's session.